Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Logan Power Show. It's me, your host, Calvin Logan. And I know that you all are enjoying what God has in store for you. I know I'm enjoying myself. Um, I know you always got to think big. Never think small. Uh, never try to uh, put yourself in a box. Always reach out. Stretch for the universe. Don't limit yourself. Well, I got with me a faith-based lady um, here. It's a good friend of the Logan family. Um, she is an entrepreneur. There's a Renaissance woman, so she knows how to get things done. Uh, she's a journalist, and she has her own photography, the one and only Miss Tiffany Hobbs. How you doing, ma'am? I am well. Thank you for having me, Calvin. It's so good to see you. <laughs> yes. If you better see each other in, in better circumstance, got to spend some time we have with family. But unfortunately, we don't have that kind of opportunity if you want to. But hey, as long as you get to see how some of my good people are doing, good friend like myself, um, you see me come a long way, seeing the same thing with yourself. Uh, it's yeah. good to see you. Yeah, um, I'm really proud of you. Congratulations on the show and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, You've come a long ways, uh, come a long ways from Westchester High School. You know, that's, that's talking about our days in represent, school. Represent, 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 represent. You know what I'm saying? Got Culver City, the Centaurs. You know, we had a little bit of the, <laughs> our riffs other side of town, but it's all good. So tell us, you have started, um, you've been doing journalism for a minute. You started your own photography company, leaping yes. out. I want to be an entrepreneur. Um your voice, you know, you like, listen, you ain't going to, they don't keep you quiet. So now you're into the, the renaissance of getting the actual picture. How did that all come about? Because you're in all the type of dads and all the type of things of life, how that came about for yourself. Yeah. So uh, great question. I come from a, a very artistic family, a family full of activists and, and radio personalities and musicians. And so it's always, all of that has always been in me innately. And so uh, it has also, that background has informed how I've navigated throughout my community and in my career and in my aspirations. So um, definitely an entrepreneurial spirit, which can be challenging, of course, uh, but through, all, through God, all things are possible. Faith and, and, and holding, holding on has, has really, really helped with that and uh, allowed me to be fruitful in many things, including photography, which I've done since I was a child, but I pursued it professionally about maybe seven years ago now, launching out and doing street photography, commissioned work. And that was, that was going really well. Uh, I was making a name for myself, was published in Ebony Magazine and LA Times and along with other uh, publications as well, and was able to transition the street photography into a merchandise store. So I also have a store and I've had that for the last year. Actually, my anniversary is coming up in January. One year anniversary. Thank you very much. It's called Shop Tipography. Very clever name. And um, I've merchandised again. I've, I've merchandised my photography uh, as well as some really black centric because that's me black focus black centric statement pieces that are available to um the public through uh home furnishings and clothing and accessories and and the like and that is my latest venture prior to that and interwoven into that again has been writing i've been really 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 blessed to be afforded the opportunity to share my voice through uh the written word as well as through vocal word. And so I've been published on Gawker before they folded. Again, the LA Times, um, uh, different publications have picked up or different mediums have picked up my writing. Uh, the list is pretty long and I don't wanna necessarily go through it, but again, I've been very blessed to be a published writer of opinion, editorial pieces, op-ed for short, that focus on the community. I live in Lamert Park. I've been here for 10 years. I'm a very proud Lamert Park resident. And so I have written extensively and intimately and honestly and critically about my communi community um, so that we can bolster the things we need and also again critique the things we don't need um, to acclaim to critical acclaim so again very fortunate uh, then as well when it comes to radio I was a radio host for about five years and had a, a couple of shows that went um, 
pretty well along the, the independent radio circuit. So I was able to hone my voice in radio, again, using all of those things, weaving them together to just continue to inform every venture I pursued, always with uh, Black pride and resiliency and uh, celebrating the beauty of Blackness um, at the foundation of everything I do. So, Absolutely. Now, coming from... You think about high school, you know, we talking about at least 15 plus years before we, you know, since we've been in, been in high school, it's a long time. Uh, so, like, like, it's been a minute since we've been, been, been in high school. And you, you think about um, our high school days, uh, us thinking about being African-American, eccentric, you know, I'm challenging the powers that be, you know, we yes. are, we are, we got a voice. Um yes. Where does that stir from? Because let's be truthful, our generation, there are some that wants to go with the flow. Some just want to pick it up now. Like you were talking about Black Lives Matter. You know, Black is beautiful. Black is everything almost 10 plus years ago when it wasn't like a popular thing to say. And you were like, well, I'm, I'm just going to say what's on, on my mind. And you always posted things about Black is beautiful. Black is everything. So where does that stir from? Again, the activism. I'm, I'm definitely a, a proud activist. I don't necessarily um, associate myself with any one group. I have been associated with certain groups, but I'm an independent activist who is, is again, um, looking out for every community where Black people reside. So I think of myself as a, um, you know, a pan-African activist. Uh, Living in Los Angeles, I think one of the misnomers is that uh, due to our diversity here, Black people don't really face a lot of discrimination or prejudicial treatment or racism. And those of us who live here, those of us who follow um, the news, perhaps if you're living outside of Los Angeles or California, you know what struggles and challenges are bestowed upon Black people. And they are vast. They are many. And they should be discussed. And again, they should be challenged. Um, and so coming from a family of activists, again, my grandfather being a radio personality in Peoria, Illinois, Riney Bryson, um, he challenged things during that time, during the 50s and 60s. And so my mother inherited that, passed that to me. And it has always been a, a, a huge part of me to be vocal, to be an advocate, and to do what I can beyond just speaking, whether it's informing, educating, galvanizing, collecting money, distributing resources, challenging um, different institutions that could be oppressive. That's always been a part of who I am. And at Westchester, at, in high school, you know, when you're a kid, oppression is everywhere. Oppression is everywhere. It's societal, it's familial, it's social and you're figuring out your voice, right? Being at Westchester, again, Westchester High School in Los Angeles, California, a very diverse school, but predominantly black, we were cocooned, we were um, uh, protected, essentially. Leaving Westchester High School, and actually, let me backtrack, I transferred to Westchester from a, an all white high school in Torrance, California, which gave me, gave me perspective, there were positives, there were, there were not so positive things that happened, which caused me to transfer, or informed my want to transfer. And coming from that environment into Westchester's all or predominantly black environment was a cultural shift that I needed. I left Westchester and I went back to a predominantly white environment in the University of Southern California, USC, where I saw discrimination, where I saw marginalization, where I involved myself in the NAACP at the campus level and the, the, the regional level. And we tackled challenges that were facing black students across Southern California uh, in equities that were not necessarily the most talked about in the media, but that were felt amongst college populations, black populations on these predominantly white campuses. So again, tackling things at the local level then the regional level, really seeing how our communities were affected, that just continued to, it became a part of me. It was already a part of me, but it didn't stop once I graduated. This doesn't stop once you transition from one environment to the next. 
if anything, you're just collecting more experiences, right, that mm -hmm. you can then use to um, build onto or into the next experience so that you can figure out how to, how to deal with those. So it just continued to move and being in Los Angeles again and really having my nose to the ground and my ears to the people and experiencing things myself police violence and inequity, housing inequity and marginalization, educational marginalization, all those societal, economic, all those things are very present. And again, they're not stopping. If anything, they are increasing as the economic divide increases, as more people become interested in our communities for our economic wealth, our artistic expression. So it, it's here, it's always here, and I've always encouraged people, no matter how old you are, to use your voice, to be an advocate. I'm also a teacher. I've been a teacher quite a few years, and I teach in our community. So dealing with students at the kinder level all the way up to the high school level, encouraging them to use their voice and to, again, advocate for the things that are important to them is, is, is integral to building community members and Black people in the community who are going to be confident enough to be fearless so that they can tackle and challenge, again, the things that are threatening who we are as a people and where we live. Amen. Now, you are different. Like you, me, and you are all in the same type of vein that, you know, I went to Culver City, Westchester. We had that little rival. Um, yeah. <laughs> mine was a huge, mine was diversity. Even though we had African-Americans there, we were still cocooned as well. And when it came to, if you wanted to kick it or have it hang out, you hanged out people who look like you. Now you did mix and mingle, but the people who could relate to you, people who look just like you. Right. Because you are a teacher and the opportunities that you were given when we went to high school and now they are now, how has that helped you teach the youth of today? Uh, Cause I know that, you know, when we went to school, we didn't have like, you know, cell phones out, you know, texting, social yeah. media. We didn't have the internet at our hands right there at the moment. You know, you had, you know, you had some money, a computer at the house, some good internet. Okay. You get on it. But for you as a teacher, and because you're a Renaissance type of uh, activist, how's that, has that teaching style changed on how you teach your kids in the classroom? Oh man, uh, great question. Thank you for that. It, first and foremost, representation matters, right? So I think, I don't know what the statistic is exactly, but in a, a loose conceptualization, black people, likely globally, but definitely here in the States, rarely have black teachers. You can count on your hand in most instances how many black teachers you have had and they likely are spread out across your entire career, including college, um, and may be concentrated mostly in your collegiate career if you're majoring in certain subjects. So representation as a black woman, as a black teacher was important to me and it's one of the reasons I decided to teach at a certain level. I was a special education teacher and then a general education teacher. So having students who look like me from my community see a teacher who looks like them, who's wearing her hair in braids or in natural styles, or is rocking red, black, and green, or it's not a caricature of blackness, but it's just black and, and very proud to be and affirming of their blackness was my goal in getting in front of these students first and foremost. Education is, is a manual. They give teachers a manual and they say, teach this. You'll be able to accomplish these benchmarks. That's what teaching is. But the teaching that I think is most important for black students and brown students, students of color, but black students specifically, is teaching that allows them to be confident in their own skin, that utilizes, recognizes their strengths and utilizes them, does not handicap them for the ways in which they express themselves. In my classroom, and I've seen viral videos that, that just warm my heart, so I can tell it's catching on, but in my classrooms, in my middle school classroom specifically a couple of years ago, I allowed my students, and I was, it was lit, it was, I was like, let's do this. I allowed my students to rap or sing or write whatever the topic was for their essay paper at a certain part in the semester. I knew I had students who 
could wrap their butts off. You can, y'all got flows. I hear you. I'm sitting with you at lunch, so I know you got flows. I know you got this. It may not trans. It may not have translated to the paper as easily or to paper as easily. The confidence they needed to be able to do written expression wasn't there for some reason. Someone had suppressed them. Someone had told them their writing wasn't good enough. Someone had shut them down. So they would shy away from the academic side of things and rely more on their creativity. Me being a creative, me understanding vocal expression and vocal tradition, you better give me them raps. You better rap this, write a 16 about this subject and you're going to perform it either to me individually or in front of the class if you would like the success of that and i graded them on that and i got pushback from my school i remember the administration was like we still need a standard so i made sure that i fit it into however i could so that i could sell that right but that's representation that's understanding your community that's cultural competency and cultural awareness community awareness not every teacher has that even some black teachers ain't got that you have to have that to teach our kids. But seeing them be confident, seeing them really spark up and light up because someone was appreciating them for who they were and was celebrating their wins, no matter how small they were wins. And it made them want to chase the next win and, and feel that sense of accomplishment and be encouraged, set a tone. And I was able to, for that class and classes prior and classes subsequently, subsequent to those, they're them, I was able to allow them to, 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 to work with where they were, challenge them to step up further, and their grades improved because of it. And, you know, pat on my own back, but I'm just going to be real. These kids are now in ninth grade, and they reach back to me and say, you know, Miss Hobbs, Miss Hobbs, your class really made me like school. It was the best class I ever had, and I'm a better writer because of it, or I'm a rapper now because of it, and I'm just... I'm musically inclined anyway. So I'm like, we're building some, some rapping generations with some, you know, some intellectual uh, capacity as well. But again, representation and, and, and understanding where your kids are and not using or viewing where they are as a handicap or as them be, being behind the ball, but going, they're amazing in their own right because of X. Not they are at a deficit because of X. Let's take who they are and show them that who they are right now, where they're at is amazing and pull that out. And so they're more willing, like with anyone, to, to, to do things when they feel like they are important, that they are valued. Teaching kids, especially black kids, they are valued is tantamount, I think, to any academic lesson you could bestow upon them. They might be able to do their algebraic equation, but if they're going out into the world feeling scared to be who they are, then what good is that? So my thing was, I'm going to create good people. I'm going to create confident kids, confident people, confident members of society. They're going to get this teaching too. But first and foremost, we're going to talk about who you are as a person. So that was, that was revolutionary um, teaching, which shouldn't be. That was radical teaching, which it shouldn't be. But because there are kind of niche pockets of educators who do that, it is deemed as, uh, you know, antithetical to what the norm is. And it shouldn't be. It should be lo in lockstep with every other type of teaching. So I'm very passionate about education. Um, I'm definitely not passionate about test scores. I, we don't even get into that. Teach the whole child, wrap around the whole child from smallest all the way up to the collegiate level teach them wrap around them embolden them empower them teach them to be good people And we are back live here at the Logan Power Show. Just hearing my good friend, Miss Tiffany Hobbs, here in the Logan Power Show, giving insight, intellect on what is needed for education. Um, the final question I have for you, and this is going to be a good one. How can we make education great again? 
Oh man. <laughs> pay your teachers. Pay teachers. I, it's hard to say pay teachers what they worth because teaching is, there's no number you can put on the value of good teaching. But compensation is important. Pay people, especially those who are taking children and molding them in the ways I discussed, or at least you should be, pay them a livable wage. Attract more black teachers to your schools, to your districts. Hire those who are culturally competent, not just uh, a token so that you have diversity represented in your staffing model. Making teachers, making teaching great again starts at the root of teaching. And without teachers, you don't have teaching, unless we're going to go to a robotic model, which could be coming, and I hope it doesn't. But we're already kind of experimenting with digitized education and seeing how successful that is. And we're seeing a, a huge divide in those who are able to, to, to successfully engage with this new modicum of teaching. We need teachers, we need black teachers, we need black male teachers in front of black students. We have a, a, an overwhelming number of black female teachers when you look at black teachers, but we need black men teaching as well. So we can see a kind of a, an even representation so students can see themselves and, and, and visualize themselves in, in these roles. So getting representation, that's I would say the crux of it all. Teaching can be great again when you have teachers who care truly, sorry about that, it's an alarm going off. When you have teachers who truly come from the community, know these students, familiarity is important. If not, you're gonna have teachers who pop in, do their, do their assignment and leave. And we don't need to see this as an assignment. It is a duty to which you are called by God to teach. Teaching is not a pass through. Um, and if you even do it temporarily, if you decide in your mind you only want to do it for a year, make that year your best year possible and impart upon these children what you need them to be going forward as children and as adults. Not a lot of people look at it that way. They look at it as a job. It ain't a job. It is a duty. It is a calling. And you find out quickly whether it's for you or whether it's not and be honest about that making teaching great again, making schooling great again. is about honesty and reflection and seeing that this didn't work, so let's do something else. Everybody doesn't fit into this neat little box. Every student is not going to test well and produce those test scores that the school needs. So I know we're kind of getting really detailed into teaching and whatnot and kind of an educational model, but this is it, it's very true. Think outside of the box. Look more at creative um, uh, using creativity to inform your educational policies and classroom strategies and, 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 and curriculum. Um, again, teach the whole child and have a black person in front of these black kids so they can teach these whole children. Amen. Well, you just heard it first, Miss Tiffany Hobbs live at the Logan Power Show. How to make education great again for students who are African American Latinos is what she's talking about. We're not saying, for instance, um, we're not trying to kind of that diversity war. She's just being speaking facts. I've always yeah. said this. I never can see something if I can't see it that someone who looks like me. Like if you said the president of the United States is not is not ideal, but someone that can say, okay, now can I identify he that person looks like me. It's maybe a possibility. Now it's a possibility. Without a possibility, without that dreaming of a possibility, it'll never happen. So um, I thank you again. Um, I know that people are inspired by you. I'm proud of you. Um, you. All I want to do is when heaven's best to you, um, to you and your family. I know, you, I know you're going to rock it out. can be one of the best teachers possible. If there are people in your classroom, they didn't need to do a standing ovation. Hey, she's going <laughs> to get you in it. She in the lion's den. So, <laughs> so let's make America's education great again. And that's people that are motivated dedicated not just to the paycheck but dedicated to the calling the bible says many are called few are chosen you gotta understand this being a teacher that is a chosen profession you are not you can say hey i'm gonna make some money no you're not making money in as a teacher i'll tell you right now that's not the profession to make money in no. trust me it's <laughs> not because what you put in in that job 
if you were to put it onto a regular other job, you're talking about at least six, seven figures off top because the amount of time you literally spend and put in your energy and everything. So I don't want to take this heated lightly. Um, I thank you all who are watching this. My name is Calvin the Logan Power Show, Nationwide World. Well, my good friend Stephanie Haas, we love you. We appreciate you. We'll see you soon. Topography, topography.threadless.com. Yay, go Calvin. Yes, yes. yes.